research object uh, for, by me and uh, Stian and a host of other projects. Okay, so the top line, too long, didn't read it, is that um, uh, research uh, objects and the approach that we've been working with with the research object org organization that we founded a, a decade ago now is a web uh, standards based uh, metadata framework for bundling resources with their context into citable reproducible packages and that's what we're going to be talking about and it's really um, three things machine actionable metadata with identifiers and web protocols as a step towards fair and what we're going to uh, be, and I will assuming everybody on this call knows what FAIR is, but I just put it down briefly there um, in case you'd uh, had a momentary lapse of memory. Um, so what we're going to talk about in this presentation is the what and why of FAIR, uh, of, uh, not FAIR, of uh, research objects and why we did it. Some examples of implementations of our Red Crate and how we've gone about it and, and tools associated with it. And then we've done um, some first steps alignment with the Fair Digital Object Framework. Uh, and we, so we've read all of Peter's papers. Uh, so, um, so this is our sort of front page uh, picture of what we really mean about uh, research object. And the idea is to do with packaging all the different aspects of a research activity or an investigation, like its publications, its data, its results, workflows, and so on, into uh, these uh, citable units that uh, we could then um, perhaps discover, we could open them up and reproduce them because we had all the different components, they, they would perhaps become executable, and that we would be using a particularly um, modern uh, web-based mechanisms of metadata description in order to be able to organize their content. So this is a kind of what we, we sort of imagine is a sort of a packaging factory. So let's go back to the real drivers of this. So we know that uh, there are many objects that are class search, all are first class citizens and all are required to make research fair. And I hear I say fair plus R, so that's fair plus reproducibility. And each of these objects has its own metadata and its own repositories. So this is the collection of things that we typically find with our uh, projects and colleagues that they're um, producing in their, in their day to day activities data articles, models, different software, and they all place them in uh, completely respectable repositories, which are the right type for that kind of artifact. Uh, so data might go into Zenodo, it might go into uh, GBIF if it's, if it's biodiversity uh, data, for example. Uh, a computational model might go into JWS Online if it's for systems biology. And uh, one of the things we'll be mentioning later on is computational workflow might go into Workflow Hub, which is a workflow registry. Um, this, the end result of this is scattered reporting and scattered reading. So, uh, so you produce all these wonderful um, components, uh, which are highly contextualized and unified with, um, we kind of understand how they all uh, work together and it might even be organized in a, um, your, your uh, local repository in a semantically sensible kind of way. And it might include links to example, to your instruments or to your specimens. And then when we come to publish them, we completely scatter it. We uh, scatter it across all of these different repositories. And then we spend all our time uh, rebuilding the original uh, context and uh, recovering the um, fragmentation and rebuilding it so that it might be reproducible. Either that or we bury it in uh, a PDF as a figure, which I, I know you're all uh, digital object people, so you all think that's a bad idea too. So what we wanted to be able to do was to be able to make sure that we could still package everything um, as it was when we were actually undertaking our research activities or our, any kind of investigative activity. So that's really the, um, one of the drivers of the approach for research objects, of which our create is a particular implementation of our vision of research objects. So we wanted to encapsulate content and references to external resources. So it's both you know, being able to encapsulate files, encap encapsulate uh, content, but also to link out to references. And I think this is very important. So it's kind of a bag of references where you can have an integrated view over those fragmented resources, particularly using uh, um, therefore identifiers and metadata that uh, 
describes those individual components and also describes how they all linked together. And that might also include references to physical objects like uh, specimens, like instruments, like mice, like people who also have uh, perfectly respectable identifiers like the resource uh, research resource identifier or uh, ORCID IDs. And of course, each of these packages has its own metadata about itself and the things within it, um, and perhaps information about the context of the experiment, what you were trying to do, uh, what the purpose of it was, and so on, that can also be registered and deposited in their own right in, say, something like Zenodo, and then unpacked and accessed and activated and reproduced as appropriate. So this was kind of uh, our vision. So this comes down to then uh, uh, that our research object is a self-describing chiefly metadata object, which has uh, these chief components. It has uh, a metadata file, uh, which is the structured metadata about uh, the object and its content, which includes things like type and identifier. Everything has identifiers. Um, a description and uh, date published and these kinds of things that come from um, uh, the expected um, on, on uh, well, schema.org actually, but um, uh, on other um, ontologies that you might identify or common data elements you might identify, like author and organization and license. And then we have files, we have directories, and we have links to web resources as the content. And all of this is packaged together in uh, using an off the shelf archive format, for example, like Bagit or like Zip. Um, so we want to use um, the, those packaging systems to actually handle all the packaging, to handle things like your checksumming. But what we're interested in the uh, point of view of this metadata file is, the, is actually the descriptions of the content we're concerned about. That also means there may be other stuff in this package, in this Bagit or Zip uh, folder that uh, we, we don't talk about in the research object and therefore we don't care about it. And then the whole thing is uh, has an identifier. In fact, everything has an identifier. So um, the uh, uh, metadata file has one, or the contents of it. So this is one kind of like schematically filled out. So uh, we might have an image file, which will have metadata associated with it. Uh, but we also have links out. So uh, we link out to the author. So this is uh, both data entities, as it were, but also contextual entities that point out to the notion of author, the notion of organization, the notion of license, which will then point to other objects like, for example, Creative Commons or an ORCID ID or, um, say, a GitHub um, entry for a script or uh, Zenodo for a link to uh, an article or or um, we might have spreadsheets actually say in the, the, um, the research object uh, package, but also link out to pointers to other spreadsheets. So it's a kind of uh, sort of mixed um, hybrid model. And we will of course point out to the research objects, uh, which are other kinds of packages. So this is a kind of schematic to kind of show you how it's, it's envisaged. So this actually really exists as a specification. So it's called RO Crate, and we haven't gone into the history of it, uh, but it's called RO Crate because we, we'd been working on this for a long time um, as a research object with a, um, some very interesting ways of using this, using sophisticated uh, metadata mechanisms from particularly from the semantic web community and on the other hand uh, there's work in digital libraries uh, called uh, a data crate which was much more simplistic using json and schema.org and we married these two together to create a re RO crate which is a much more straightforward way of doing what we were originally doing in our early more perhaps um uh, sort of researchy type work. Now it's much more pragmatic and um, uh, production uh, level. So this is um, so this approach means that we have a strict structure, but we enable open-ended content. And I think I kind of mentioned that a, a little bit earlier on. So how do we describe the metadata? We use identifiers, we use JSON-LD, and we use schema.org descriptors. So it's a kind of opinionated profile of schema.org, but it's kind of linked data by stealth. 
So that means that we can use JSON, but with a gradual path to extensibility to JSON-LD uh, with um, additional ad hoc terms. So we uh, originally, we were much more exposing of uh, sort of thinking about um, linked data from a, a much more semantic webby kind of way. And now we're much more um, simple. And that has a huge benefit for developers uh, because it makes it developer friendly. And that's really critical. Um, we also have example driven documentation, again, for developers to make it developer friendly. There is extensible because, as I said, it has to have open ended content because you can never predict what people uh, will will uh, need to add. So there's a clear extensibility mechanisms for extending it with additional schema.org or uh, domain ontologies. And you can define a checklist of what you expect to see there by defining a profile about which is this is the expectations of what I want to see. And well, I'll show you a bit of a profile a bit later on. So this is just a little bit under the hood that shows that all these things exist. Um, and uh, there's a website which we're on uh, version 1.1. Um, and uh, so there's examples of this and uh, how, you, how you actually express one of these um, RO crates. So in summary, an RO crate in a nutshell is this lightweight packaging approach uh, to packaging uh, research uh, data entities is which actually which are actually any object they're called data entities technically it means you can aggregate files and or any uri addressable content uh, with contextual information uh, which uh, aids of course decisions about who what when where why is web native it has machine readable and human readable and i think stian's going to make that point very strongly later on and it's search engine friendly because it uh, uses quite a lot of schema.org it's also very familiar to uh, to developers and it's extensible and integrate uh, into in and um incremental so you can add metadata and you can also develop sort of nested um and interlinked uh, research objects because it's all this kind of organization around pointers and it's, it's kind of effectively typed, not through a, an, a type assertion system, either, but by the specification of a profile of what you expect to see in the, um, the research object, the RO crate. It's been uh, developed as an open community effort and uh, 38 people have put their name to the actual, their hands upon the GitHub in order to be able to produce the spec from Australia, from the US, and from uh, Europe, we have meetings every month, once later tonight, and they're at tricky times because we have to deal with all these communities. So because we made this developer friendly, means that there's both user facing tools. So for example, this is a Describo uh, system from uh, the University of Technology in Sydney, which is an interface to being able to make and uh, browse uh, research objects. And we also have infrastructure facing uh, tooling, software libraries in Python, in JSON, um, and um, uh, Ruby, and so on. So that's very helpful. So here's a few examples. So uh, that uh, Describo tool that I just mentioned uh, from Australia, uh, that's been uh, used and developed as part of a cultural heritage project, which is a data curation service for endangered languages in Australia, which has, you know, half a million files and different collections. And there they're interested in long term preservation and accessibility of uh, their research data objects. And uh, so they um, have a platform called Archisto, which is based, which is uses these uh, research objects um, underneath the hood and the Describo tool uh, as a user facing tool so that you can make um, as, as people do their research, as they collect um, their um, language files and put them into collections, they're making these uh, RO crates as they do the research. So during the process of them doing the collection and then the reviewing of it, they're making these um, RO crates. Uh, another example, this is from the NIH Data Commons. This comes from uh, Kesselman and Foster. 
um, as part, they, they develop something called big data bags. What their problem is, is that they're processing very large genomic and clinical data that's distributed over multiple locations. And they want to be able to not move the data around unless they absolutely have to. They want to be able to move the pointers around. So they want to move bags of data by moving bags of links to those data. So they use uh, the, this uh, research object approach in order to be able to create something they call big data bags which they produce and consume in their uh, workflow processing, where they're doing high throughput sequencing uh, processing, actually. So they needed scalable, verifiable collections of references. And there they're using it in order to be able to manage kind of uh, transferring data only on demand. Um, but they can also use it to do controlled access to sensitive data as well, because they're moving references, they're not moving data. So that's a quite an interesting uh, project. A third project that uh, uses RO-GRADE is uh, the European Open Science Cloud Life project, which is one of these cluster projects in Europe um, that is, uh, this unites 13 different communities in the life sciences, of which uh, one I'm particularly working in, which is Elixia, which is life science data, uh, 23 countries managing life science data. So this project is really about building a European data and method thematic commons for life sciences so that we'll be able to share data tools and workflows in the cloud. So it's very orientated around data um, in the cloud, but also around the workflows in the cloud. And there's a pretty picture of a workflow there. It's all to do with containerization, these kinds of things. So there we have an entire infrastructure um, activity, an ecosystem of infrastructures around computational workflows. So, you know, Uber, Uber script processing, as it were. Well, we have a basket of workflow systems and their own repositories. Uh, the Nextflow system, Galaxy, SnakeMake, and so on, uh, that use GitHub and their own sort of versions of their repositories. We have a registry called Workflow Hub which is agnostic to all those different workflow management systems, but enables to have a common place to register them. And then we have testing and monitoring platforms. So the workflows are registered in Workflow Hub, they're executed in these systems, uh, they're developed in, in their repositories of those systems, and we have this testing frameworks in order to be able to do continuous testing of them. And here we're using RO Crate as the exchange mechanism between all of these different components. Um, including uh, the workflows, data that they use as their uh, testing data, for example, example data, um, recording dependencies, portability, all of these different aspects all use. So a little glimpse into that from the point of view of the workflow hub, which is a workflow a registry. Um, so this is an example of uh, a workflow. Actually, this is from the BioExcel project by recall correctly, this is a simulation. And you'll see at the top, um, so you can view it on uh, view, view on GitHub because that's where it's, it's really, uh, uh, that's where it's all being developed, uh, but it has a download as RO Crate. And this means that you can package up everything about that workflow um, and download it as a research object. And uh, here's the, you know, uh, uh, for those uh, JSON fans amongst you, here's a glimpse of the JSON in order to be able to prove it really exists. So of course we have a profile for this, for, uh, for workflows, it's called Workflow RO Crate. So what that does is, so here's, a, here's another example. This is a Verify workflow from the European Bioinformatics Institute. Again, you can see the download RO Crate. And this actually is an interesting one because um, it has two execution flavors. It has uh, an execution flavor in as the common workflow language and an execution flavor as next flow. So different workflow engines, uh, but the same conceptual workflow. And uh, so we have a profile for what we expect to see in one of these, uh, these research objects, which are workflow research objects, as opposed to some other data type. So we can say what the concept, what we expect to see in the package and what we expect to see as the descriptions, the properties associated with those, those um, components in the package. And the descriptions about what we expect to see are defined as a bioschema profile. So that's a very opinionated description of uh, using schema.org to see what do we expect to see 
as the properties associated with the main workflow and, uh, and so on. So this is how we describe our profiles. So we're also now beginning to get this uh, approach um, in because it is quite lightweight embedded into infrastructures and standards. And here's a two from Europe. Um, it's part of the um, EGI ACE data spaces for earth science researchers through the Reliance project. They have a RO hub. Um, and uh, there's also the um, CS3 mesh for EOSC project, which is uh, leveraging off the, uh, the Australian work actually to put um, RO crate into Zenodo. So both of these are actually um, looking to um, instrument uh, Zenodo as an RO crate um, platform. And on the uh, other US side, we have examples from uh, Seven Bridges, which is an extremely well-known genomics platform, um, and Mendeley Data. And there it's used to exchange between the two platforms through the, the repository and the processing platform. And also it's, a, it's part of the Food and Drug um, Agency uh, standard IEEE 72791 uh, for standardizing uh, high throughput sequencing um, in a regulatory way in something called biocompute objects. And again, you need to package things together. And how do we package things together? We package them with RO Crate. So um, something uh, I wanted to, to highlight here was that uh, I think is important is that we try to use RO Crate at different points in the research life cycle. So this is a traditional research life cycle picture. It actually comes from uh, an Elixir system. Um, and you can see that we're using RO Crate for exchanging and importing between platforms, uh, reporting and archiving, uh, being able to share um, and, uh, of course, reuse and reproduce because we've got all the different components in that package. But uh, something we want to emphasize is that you want to be able to use these to describe the objects as they're being created. And that's what was happening in the Australian system. And you also want to be able to release the objects as they're created. So as you do processing, for example, in the uh, workflows, when we're building workflows, we release uh, a, um, uh, an RO crate with uh, that, those, those workflows, but then there's new versions and new versions and new versions. So this kind of uh, research lifecycle uh, circle is of course nonsense because what you're doing is you're churning within it in these different routes. And what we try to make sure is that the infrastructures are able to do that using RO Crate as a mechanism to be able to support um, descriptions of objects as they're being minted, as well as being able to release objects as they are circulating around the, uh, the different platforms. So just before I um, launch into um, Stian's techni very technical piece, I wanted to highlight that um, a very important thing. This was the, these, these terms here are the terms we used when we tried to build uh, RO Crate or, or the research objects. Um, it was kind of desiderata as it were. And one of the key things that we learned was developer friendliness. So in the first instantiation of research objects, we try to be quite academic, I would say. Um, and uh, in the second incarnation, we've actually been much more focused around developer friendliness, really looking at what was the just enough uh, complexity and standards. Um, so we've done just enough linked data, just in time, and we've really gone for the point of simplification rather than generalization. We haven't attempted to, to do uh, a, a generic everything. We try to make things quite simple. Um, and we try to walk the line between retaining the benefits of things like linked data, plus all the developer needs of all the different things that you have. And something we've really found important is that it's important to take technologies that are where familiarity is key if you want uptake, and also to limit flexibility, because if you limit flexibility, you free up developers. If you give too much flexibility, it's quite hard to develop against them. So uh, we're about to segue. Um, I wanted to um, highlight the fact, of course, now we're talking about FAIR digital objects, and you're on this course, so you will know about FAIR digital objects. They appear in the EOSC interoperability framework that's just been published. Here's a groovy picture about them. And here's the, I think this is Peter Wittenberg's original uh, Death Star picture of uh, what a, a research object looks like. 
as a, a digital object with identifiers and metadata, contextual metadata associated with it. Something we're doing with Alex, an artist who's on the call, is that so we see fair digital objects as these actionable knowledge units uh, being piloted, piloted in a project to do with digital twinning, uh, digital butterflies in the biodiversity arena. So you go from the physical uh, object to a virtual object. And this is, again, it's a bag of pointers. It's a way of pointing out to all the different aspects, the genomic data, the geographical data, the ecological data, which will be held in different places in, in the uh, um, uh, ecosystem of uh, repositories that this, this digital butterfly will live in. And uh, so we are currently working um, in the um, Synthesis Plus project, which is a project of uh, uh, research infrastructure called DISCO, um, to figure out how might, might we combine uh, research objects, and the, particularly the RO crate, with fair digital objects as represented by a digital specimen. So in the Synthesis Plus project, there is this notion of the fair digital object framework with a digital specimen. In the uh, uh, the Elixir, uh, the Ask Life project I told you about with workflows, we have all this workflow infrastructure which uses our own crates, and uh, we're marrying the two. We're figuring out um, how could we combine the two so that we create packaged and actionable objects. And at this point, I move to Stian, and he will say next slide, please. All right. So just a quick intro for. FDO, so in case you all forgotten about it, uh, this is my take on this, so please apologize when I get it totally wrong here. You see now that that star has been made a slightly more positive, so there's a more friendlier little star full of things. And you start with the persistent identifier. This is how you look up your digital object. Uh, using operations, you can find the things like the bit sequence or the metadata. and uh, you can also aggregate this digital object in a collection, which of course is as well a digital object. Notably, or even the metadata is a digital object. So the same rules applies to both the collection and the metadata. So that's my uh, 50 second summary of it. So now the idea is, next slide please. <laughs> we thought, hmm, what we've done in our create kind of looks like the same, doesn't we? We have kind of implemented those things, except we don't call it fair digital objects. So uh, next. So let's have a quick look at the RCrate model, step by step, slowly, please. Uh, so we start with the RCrate metadata file in the corner, as Carol says, that's your metadata object. You have the RCrate itself, that's what we call a data set. We, we're using schema org there. You see the PIDs appearing around here for their recoveries, which has some data entities as parts. Now those need some descriptions, next. And those, you can be using various contextual entities, things in the world, things like people, organizations, uh, instruments, and so on. And uh, of course, there are also different types of data, like Carol mentioned, uh, which you can specify using uh, subtypes like that. Now, competition workflows we find a bit funny because it's a bit in between. You use a workflow for making data, so it's kind of contextual, but also it's usually a downloadable thing. So if you do next, you will see that it's actually uh, both of these types, one more. Uh, so it's both types, So and that's okay, right? You can add, add the workflow as well to your research. Object. Even though it's not really data, it's kind of part of the research object aspect of it. So we think both of these aspects are important part of a research object, like Carol mentioned. And we talked about biodiversity, obviously where you took a sample from so on also is important. If we go next now, uh, this was a minor detail that these contextual can connect to each other, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, so just a brief scary look at the JSON. This is the only magic you need to make it link data. Okay, so forget about the first line and then just go on to the next block. And here you see we have the metadata file descriptor. We say declare itself as being a research object metadata file. Next which then is described in the second block saying here is the data set, which has some parts. If you do next, we can highlight that. There you go. So these are the, the different data entities. And then of course we have metadata about the 
research object itself, which again could be references to other contextual entities or could just be a string value like a uh, description and so on. And then we, we just keep adding on these blocks for each of the entities that we need to describe. So it's just a flat list. And uh, so there's just no more structure to it. That's the whole structure you have. So if you go to the next slide, you can see how we then kind of show link data by stealth. First, you're just giving these three different blocks to saying, here's an image, uh, the author is, a, is this thing. And if you look up that idea, it's a person. And if you look up the affiliation of that, it's an organization. So that's why how you can just look up the identifiers in the flat list that's you're basically doing linked data, but don't tell anyone, right? So, so we're just kind of uh, forming in these little objects that you can describe things. And that's what our creators all about is just giving these little examples how to describe these main types. And then we can go on next. So if we look a bit about identifiers, uh, there are, you, you might have noticed there are a few different approaches to it. So we're, we're not like forcing everybody, you know, to make a, a DOI for every little CSV file they make but ideally they should get to that part, but they might just start straight straight on the desktop. That's like the lowest case that Cal mentioned on using something like Describer, gather metadata as early as you can. And you don't know yet where the data is going to live, but so you just use relative parts. Then you start adding in these existing uh, identifiers and URLs, particularly to people, reference data sets, and so on. Uh, citations, most obvious one. And there are mechanisms for making uh, these relative parts you have to make them absolute, even if you don't know where they live. I'm not going to go into that, but if you're interested in that, do contact me and I can show you that. Finally, the, the kind of perfect resource base where everything has been giving PIDs all the way down. Every little file has, has its own uh, permalink or, or DOI or something like that. And that's more for long-term availability. So you kind of want to progress towards the scale, a kind of gradual ascent towards FAIR. So if you go next. Uh, so we do talk about files. I don't think we can escape the files. People do use files quite a lot. So that's your bit sequences. And as I said, that's our starting point. They are just files on disk. Uh, as Carol mentioned, they can also be things on the web. Uh, ideally with some more permalinks rather than something that appear, disappears next week. But still, even if that's the best we have, you should be allowed to annotate that. As I said, there are different ways to archive the R crate to help make it more long uh, living, right? Like Carol mentioned, uh, bag it, that will add your checksums and so on. BD bag allows you to do the same, but including all these external files. And then you have more archival format. So you can do this over longer time scales and track changes in different ways. It could be uh, even using Git because you now you can do large files for that. Next. Okay, now for repositories, it's kind of open-ended for, for our crate. So we, we are giving you the metadata model and, and where you want to deposit it. It's not something we mandate or, or say where to do. So again, you could just start with having your good old supplementary data, but now actually with metadata. Uh, one of the models we talked about with Workflow Hub was to add things to the GitHub's uh, maintenance of particularly for workflows, because then can be the metadata can live where the data is being maintained. Um, but you can also think of it like an exchange format, like we talked about uh, the workflow hub using our creator, so kind of back and forward kind of format. So you can have a collection of things with the metadata, particularly for our workflow hub, we care about the typing of things, right? Because we need to pick up the workflow, for instance. And that goes hand in hand with these profiles Carol mentioned. Uh, then we're moving further on along deposits on putting things in uh, things like just general things in auto institutional repositories. Uh, again, now you have your metadata suddenly appearing in two places. They're both inside the research of it, and also you need some higher level uh, research of uh, metadata in that particular repository, uh, which you can, of course, convert back and forward. Uh, but uh, you won't necessarily in that institutional repository be able to see inside unless you open up the research objects. So you can uh, go further in. Then you have, but we, we cannot give up all these domain specific repositories. Uh, we know they are, and we, sh we should definitely reuse them as, as and by reference, and we should not force them. And for individual files and metadata, it gets a bit more murky. So 
there are many different ways to do it. Usually it depends on who's paying, right? Because you need to store some big data somewhere. Someone has to be paying for that. And usually that seems to be affecting what kind of identifiers you go. And that's where we need a bit more uh, maybe help from FDO community and how to harmonize that across many of the different ones. I, Carol mentioned before the BD bug and MinID, which does some work with that. If we go next, I'll just quickly show uh, my little summary, what I think, my little take, and what could FDO possibly learn from what, all our little mistakes and approaches that we've done over time. Now, I mentioned data and contextual entities. So I think we should re-emphasize all the contextual entities as well, right? So it's not all about the data, right? The data, it doesn't live in isolation, it needs to be connected to things in the world. And that's particularly where uh, the identifiers for those are important and also the descriptions of those identifiers. And there's so many wheels already invented that uh, we should reuse and fit into. For instance, how people are already doing the research, uh, we have to fit into how they do their practices. We cannot just change totally what their, their infrastructure is, gradually come into improving them, make it more fair step by step. And reusing technology, but not if it makes it too complex, right? So if there, there's lots of traps, if you just throw everything in the toolbox in, it looks like it could all work, but it, it, it might make a bit of a soup of it. So you only use this, the simple technologies that are easy approach for developers. The PID infrastructure, there's already lots of in, uh, existing work done there. So in, and I wouldn't want to include URLs in there. So because people just click hyperlinks, they know what they are. So we cannot throw those away, we need to keep those in the system. And we found using existing metadata standards like schema or that gave us a flying start basically, because we didn't have to sit or invent, how do you describe people? How do you describe uh, documents? It's already in there, a very good starting point, but it needs to be extendable because there's usually not enough, but it, is, it should be giving a very good starting point. People are very important, especially developers. Please think about us, right? <laughs> but also the developer, the, the real scientists who want to, to look at the research object or the digital object, they are not going to sit and call various operations or look at the JSON files. They need a human rendering for this. So that's why we have, need to have tools that can generate uh, at, at least some kind of tableau view of the metadata, ideally something more specific, domain specific. For developers, we do like uh, this approach of having best practice guidance. Uh, we hope that it is, is firm, but not too restrictive, right? So you still have a bit of choice of how to do it for your particular thing. And we know things are not always known beforehand, right? So you need to be open for things to change even after you made your objects, right? So particularly reusing uh, identifiers, we know the metadata that comes with them is not always the right one for where, how you want to use it. So you need to be able to contextualize the metadata. And the same for types. There might be imperfect types to start with and you come with you later on. And second slide, I'll quickly do the opposite direction. What can we learn from the FDO approach? So I think we need to think more about identifiers, right? So we, we have the identifiers and we encourage them, but we're not giving strict guidance of towards infrastructure or for framework developers, but how can they do a good job in making sure that their arrow crates are also becoming fair, are actually getting all the benefits that are, are really are already there. And tooling can help on that. For instance, we mentioned Synodo, a tool that can automatically upload arrow crate and fill in the metadata, for instance. And the, there's been a lot of talk in this community about type systems, and I think we are looking to formalize that even more. We have our profiles that we start with, and uh, I think it could be formalized more, but again, I want to make it not too semantic, not too restrictive, because I think that's a bit of dangerous if we lock too many doors, right? And uh, turtles all the way down, of course, Carol mentioned that we have our crates in an hour crate, but there's lots of consideration for doing when you want to do that, whereas right? so you need to decide in the granularity. And that kind of data modeling is often difficult for a scientist because they're used to just having it all in one go, here's my project, right? And it's like a thousand different things, but running over three different years. And that's something we've been working on in other projects. So having a kind of framework for how you structure things often helps there. Yeah, so that's it for my, right? And then Carol can 
so yeah, so to conclude, um, we, we were looking, we're looking particularly in the Synthesis uh, Plus project, along with Alex Hardesty, um, to really examine how ROCRA can be part of the uh, fair digital object ecosystem around a very concrete use case. And concrete use cases are good because you really have to build things, really have to deal with the details, the nuts and bolts. Uh, and and we observation at the 50,000 feet is that they're both bags of references and metadata, but they have slightly different um, relationship, or slightly different um, emphasis on that. Uh, RO Crate is a metadata framework, uh, which we think will be a very useful metadata framework for the fair digital objects. It's very developer friendly and practical. It's got weight web native developments and implementations, it's got a real community, it's got infrastructure applications. It's currently being used. Uh, and the, the fair digital objects are a framework for actionable objects in the way that ROCREATE is more passive, but ROCREATE could provide, uh, enable those active operations. And also the fair digital object ecosystem offers these additional infrastructure and practices that uh, Stian just, just mentioned. So, so what we're doing now over the next year or two actually um, is uh, working with Alex, really kicking the tires into really uh, working, joining up these two approaches under this real context. And um, I think that's it. And there's, here's all the people who've contributed um, in some way or other to um, this activity. And you can, that tells you um, something about the uh, community. Uh, it's a big community. Okay, and that's, that's it, uh, Anya. Yeah, thank you very much, Kelly.